Okay, yeah. my pleasure to introduce Mike Askinall to talk about the next theme session about the broad world of senses and how we continue that from that last talk. Thanks. Yeah, so a bit of change of pace, or, or really to demonstrate really the diversity of this community, um, and and the rather embarrassingly a community that required uh, this to for me to meet a colleague of my own from Lancaster. So I've never met um, Alex before, even though we work at the same university and in neighbouring buildings. So that's that's the icebreaker there. <laughs> Um, I originally got involved with the, the digital, the NERC digital community from having um, an embedded researcher grant and that was looking at monitoring um, tritium um, uh, contamination in groundwater um, in situ around nuclear sites. But today I'm presenting on the development of a new ground level cosmic radiation neutron monitor. So a lot of my research is around detecting radiation of any type, mainly neutrons, uh, but mainly neutrons. Um, it's a collaboration um, that involves um, the UK Atomic Energy Agency, who are doing a lot of our modelling efforts, uh, Mirian Technologies, who are supplying a lot of the instrumentation for this technology, um, and our end user at the end of the day is going to be the Met Office and the global community, as you'll soon learn. So around about five years ago, the UK made a conscious effort to try and improve its space weather monitoring and prediction capabilities. And that resulted in UKRI between STFC and NERC funding a £20 million um, consortium of programmes or projects um, that went by the name of Space Weather Instrumentation, Measurement, Modelling and Risk or Swimmer. There's 11 pro programmes or projects in total, six funded directly by NERC who were focusing model, more on the modelling aspects and, and the other five funded by STFC. Uh, the main aim of the SWIMMER consortium um, was focusing on space radiation and changes in the upper atmosphere because of the, the risks that they pose to um, critical global infrastructure. So that's um, aircraft systems, aviation, communication and navigation through um, satellites, uh, power grids, um, severe space weather can cause um, transforms to overload as power grids across entire continents to fail, transportation and other um, ground level systems. Um, so much so, um, severe space weather actually exists on the UK National Risk Register, uh, and this is a list of perceived risks um, scored in terms of their impact and likelihood. Now, the, within the same cell that impact and likelihood scores, alongside severe space weather, sits surface water flooding, poor air quality, um, antimicrobial um, resistance, widespread public disorder, and believe it or not, high consequence infectious disease outbreaks. So I think of all communities, you appreciate that all of those have happened in recent times, and so it's only a matter of um, a, a time really before we have a severe space weather event which could cause um, uh, an impact of that magnitude. Um, so take no notice of the slide numbers, I've got some hidden slides so they, they, this talk doesn't go on and on and on, there's actually less than 20 slides for a 20 minute slot so um, we should be good with timekeeping. But this is the overview of my presentation. I'll, I'll introduce the principles and the status of the current system. Ground level nutrient monitoring has been done since the 50s. Um, and it's my job to sort of uh, redesign that, that aging and dying network. Um, I'll address some of the aims, the methods we employed, um, present to you our initial design, some results, and then conclusions and future work um, wrapping up. They're about, the, about nine months remaining of this project. So the idea of, of um, ground level neutron monitoring is that we're able to deduce the primary cosmic radiation particles by monitoring cosmic radiation variations and fluxes of solar energetic particles at the Earth's surface. Um, this is useful for um, doing solar cycle modulation observations, um, observing forebush decreases, which is a, a drop in cosmic radiation detected at, at the ground level before um, an, an increased um, burst of, of radiation and the geomagnetic effects as well. Um, the hard solar energetic particles or SEMs, so these are energies greater than 300 MeV, are the ones that pose considerable risk 
And when they're detected at the Earth's surface, they're given the term ground level enhancement event. And it's Leeds in the UK, which holds the record for the largest ever ground level enhancement event ever recorded, um, which dates back to 1956. And in the mid eighties, we actually, the UK decommissioned all of its ground level neutron monitors for this purpose. So we're currently without our own. There's around one GLE a year. Um, they range uh, from one to 12 hours um, with a whole host of magnitudes from taking out power grids, like what happened, I think Quebec 89 took out a whole power grid um, to, to the barely noticeable ones. And around about May, uh, um, the time of the London 2012, about two weeks before the London 2012 Olympics, we just we just missed quite a large event, um, just missed us by about two weeks. So that could have been a whole different story of that that large uh, global event. Um, we monitor uh, the primary cosmic radiations from the cosmic radiation fluctuations and variations at the, at the Earth's surface. The, the plot here shows uh, an incoming cosmic ray interacting with the nitrogen and oxygen in the Earth's um, atmosphere and um, creating a secondary cascade shower of radiation. And it's those neutrons, mostly the neutrons that we're interested in detecting in our instruments. So it can provide early warning of ground level enhancement events, these devices, um, uh, and they operating as a global network feed into input data for the models that deduce the primary cosmic radiation flood. They're also used, which also may be interest to this community, they're also used to calibrate um, soil moisture sensors, part of the, the COSMOPS network as well. So as I was saying, this has been done since the 50s. This is the current standard and the current um, state of the monitors still in operation. It's the Neutron Monitor 64. 1964, the year it was standardised by uh, an engineer physicist called um, Carl Michael. Um, they pr uh, predominantly record the secondary neutrons. So a, a neutron comes in, it interacts with the lead producer, which is the lead annuli you can see in the cutaway there. And those, that's produced a burst of fast neutrons, so it's amplifying the signal essentially. We moderate those fast neutrons, so we thermalize them, we take out the energy so they become slow thermal neutrons. And then we use a thermal neutron detector to detect them, and that's how they currently work. This is a six tube NM64. Um, the, the detector, the thermal neutron detector that they use is, is boron trifluoride, um, a highly toxic gas built inside a large canister with an anode, anode wire that um, moves through the middle. They're ionization chains essentially, and I'll talk a little bit about that because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that's quite new to this community. They're pretty big instruments. This six tube NM64 is about 10 ton. The 18 tube NM64 goes up to 36 ton. The large instruments, they're bulky, they're expensive to house, they're expensive to ship and transport, especially with the highly toxic toxicity of BF3, now deemed not even suitable for use, um, even with engineered mitigations. Um, and so there's a lot of cost associated with them, including supporting archaic electronics to, to get the readout of the signals. That's an example of one of the large BF3s used. Um, LND say they still make something that's equivalent, but getting hold of these detectors is pretty tricky now. Of the current network, they feed into the Neutron Monitor database. And this is a screenshot from that website showing where each of these monitors are located. There's about 50 of them still operational and um, feeding into this database. The UK is without its own. We rely on ULU um, in Finland, and Dorbs in Belgium, and both of, uh, I think the Dorbs one especially is a little bit temperamental. So we're trying to build models with instruments which are going offline from time to time. And we need that, I'm told the modelers need that continuous run of data. And that's what they currently don't have. And they don't have it from a UK context either. So we're taking a three slide sidestep, that's a tongue twister to test me. Um, just just to talk a little bit about neutrons, that's not a neutron, that's um, an atom um, that consists of some neutrons and protons and electrons. Um, but the neutron is a similar size to the proton. It's got zero electric charge, which means it easily penetrates matter. So it'll go through the electron cloud unperturbed and you can interrogate, interrogate the, the, um, the nucleus of material. 
And so that makes it very useful for a whole host of applications, but it also makes it really difficult to detect. And so to detect neutrons, you need an intermediary medium to induce an electric charge. And the way we do that is we use something, a material with a high cost cross section to neutrons. And typically that's helium three. It's widely used. Um, because, of it, because of its high thermal neutron absorption cross-section, this is the reaction that happens. A neutron comes in, is absorbed by the helium-3. Um, that produces tritium, um, an isotope of hydrogen, and, and a, pro a proton, which is your ionizing um, particle um, to use in, in an ionization chamber. Um, it has to be in gas form because it's a noble gas, and so you can't, come, you can't make a solid... Um, compounds can be fabricated. Um, and as a result of um, the 9-11 incident, um, there was a, a big uptick in the use of helium-3 for security and safeguards applications at around about the same time that um, nuclear weapons treaty came into play. And helium-3 is a byproduct of nuclear weapons production. So just as we realized we had um, a limited supply of helium-3, the demand for helium-3 went up for security applications, and so the cost of helium-3 went up. So about 10 years ago, there was a massive scare in the community, safeguards and security community, that we can't afford helium-3 and it's not going to survive, uh, sustain our needs and our requirements, and so the cost shot up, and people started to look at alternative detector technologies. And there's a whole host of research in alternative neutron detector technologies, but still nothing comes close to the de detection efficiency, reliability, stability of helium-3. So it is still the king for detecting neutrons if you want to do it with avoiding BF3. So that's how they're structured. You've got a, a pressurized tube with helium-3 and some other inert gases inside, nanode, cathode, incoming uh, neutron is absorbed by that helium-3, you get an ionization particle, the proton, and that is amplified as it travels through the gas, creates further ionization and amplification, and then you get to detect a signal, okay? And we, we, we have a high voltage bias across the, the, um, uh, the detector to create that electric field. So stepping back into the original um, slide deck now, um, our aim is to develop a, a new type of instrument uh, that's networkable for monitoring neutrons at ground level. It's got to be an operational, which is quite key for the application requirements. This isn't a research tool. It's got to be an operational instrument that's going to serve the UK Met Office and be the UK's flagship only neutron detector at present. It needs to be cheaper, more compact, and still capable of producing comparable results to uh, an NM64. And then the hope and the impact and the ref impact would be that we see a major increase in monitoring worldwide uh, and enhanced global capabilities. Uh, we're going to feed data into MOSWAP, which is the Met Office Space Weather Operations Center. Um, and that's the guy behind many monitors there. Uh, probably too many monitors for one person to keep an eye on. But anyway. So, um, good for time. Um, some of the methods that we employed, we, we had a look uh, all those other alternative technologies available for detecting neutrons based on our operational experience, based on the efficiency, the reliability, the availability, and borrowing heavily from nuclear security applications and safeguards applications, we, we opted for, um, we used that to influence our decision and, and we came back to, to using helium-3. Um, before we, we go any further though, bottom left figure shows what we proposed. We said, look, let's see what other detector technology exists out there. That means we can avoid BF3, potentially avoid expensive helium-3, and let's use them in two, one or two different arrangements. Either directly drop them into the existing configuration of the NM64, so that's the, the lead annuli with the wings shown on the left, so a different detector technology placed inside there. And some of the NM64s have actually employed helium-3, and then went back to BF3 because of the, the price scares. Um, and then the other option is put multiple detectors, smaller diameter, um, but a higher concentration, increasing the packing density directly in the uh, moderating material. 
So um, that's a different look at, at the um, production, moderation and detection um, methodology of, of this technique. So we did that. We did an evaluation of detectors. We considered boron coated straws as an alternative. We then did a modeling led redesign. Um, before we did that, we took a benchmark, which is the top right figure, to see how good the NM64 was designed, how optimized it was for the mass of lead. Anything in the green box there shows something that's achieved a higher cap rate for a lower mass of lead. So very few beat the NM64, and that's probably uh, a result of oversimplification of our model. So it did a good job. Anything in the red, you get high counting efficiency, but for a higher cost of lead. So it was very well designed. We then went to a parameterized model for the generation of thermal neutrons in uh, the, the main uh, detector location, optimized all of that, optimized the detector location. So we came up with a, an optimized design for helium-3 detectors, which the NM64, just replacing the BF3 for helium-3, failed to do. <clears throat> We've done various experimental um, validations of our simulations, and we've got good agreement, and we've got many of those to show you today. Um, the next thing we're looking to do in the next couple of months, um, or certainly by the end of this month, is sign off on an engineered uh, solution and then go on to deployment um, at uh, a Met Office field site in Camborne um, before the end of the year. So this is what we've achieved. Um, we've, we've got something that's a smaller footprint, smaller volume, less mass, and it's cheaper than the NM64. You can see our new, new uh, neutron monitor footprint is the dark grey box compared to the six tube NM64, which was our benchmark. Um, and we, we estimate that it's 50% cheaper before we take into consideration the savings um, associated with housing a smaller instrument, not having to ship highly toxic BF3s. Um, um, and, and a smaller, smaller housing. Uh, we've achieved that by increasing the packing density um, of the detectors. That's what it looks like. And then I just want to finish with some promising results because we haven't actually got an instrument yet, but we've got something that's very similar to this instrument. Uh, this is uh, an N50L passive neutron monitor loaned by Mirian Technologies. It's used for um, material, uh, nuclear, special nuclear material um, assay, accountancy, uh, and security applications. We put it in a load of lead, we ran it for several weeks with and without lead, and we got some data, and then we compared that to the data that we saw from the um, uh, neutron monitor database. So if we take a quick look at that, um, here's some of the monitors, Keel through to Young One, um, in the um, existing um, global network based loosely or, or mostly on the NM64 and then our N50L in the most right column. Now the two that stand out for having similarities is the Keel 2 monitor to ours in terms of latitude, longitude, altitude, um, geomagnetic cutoff. So it's those two that I'm looking to compare on the next slide. It's a much smaller monitor, our NM50L, so we've applied a scaling factor of 144, um, and you can see that it tracks the, um, the fluctuations seen on the, um, the NM, um, the neutral monitor database for the different monitors. We're interested in looking at it compared to the keel, which is the black line, um, and the next slide will do some scaling of that, and this is for a 24 hour roll um, count rate. You can see how we get the um, amplification of the signal when we include the lead from the magenta in the bottom to the magenta at the top. Um, so that's how it's going to be operated in the top there. Very quickly rounding up. That NN50L, which is helium-3 tubes in polyethylene monitor moderator in lead, is very similar to our design. It's about, um, it, it's seen 2.5 pounds per second. The keel monitor is three times bigger than our benchmark, six tube, and that's seen about 60 counts per second. Our proposed design is 18 times bigger than the, NM, the N50L, which takes us up to around about 40 counts per second, 45 counts per second for our proposed design. So we're, we're getting close to the target. We're in the right order of magnitude, which is early positive. 
data, and this is before every, all the optimization has been included. Um, I'm conscious of time coming up to the minutes. Um, we've made something smaller. Uh, we've got promising long count rate data with an analog. We're going to deploy later this year, um, continue doing some uh, validation to improve the fidelity of our um, models, um, including utilizing the SDFC simulation source. Um, so watch this space. The UK is going to have its own neutral monitor to provide you better cosmic radiation data for better calibration of your cosmic uh, of your soil moisture sensors and other things. Thank you very much. Can you hear me here? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Man. Um, okay, just time for one question. Um, can you explain in a bit more detail about the impacts that such a ground level and a city event would actually has? Um, you you a, kind of terrified me at least yeah. about listing so many possible outcomes. So ground-based stuff and some other stuff that's going on at Lancaster Research um, is you can induce a ground currents and railways um, use currents down the lines to determine where the train is located on the track so that you don't get trains running into each other. If you get a severe um, ground level enhancement event and currents induced in the, the Earth's surface, you can get artificial currents on the railway track lines and the signal of those systems can fail. Trains can be held up, trains can be released, trains crashing. So that's one example. <laughs> wow. Okay. Ask, ask Jim Wilde at Lancaster more about that. Yeah. It can take out transformers so you lose power. <laughs> can take out satellite navigation and communication. So you're trying to repair the power grid without communication, without the internet, have an afternoon without the internet, have an afternoon without your mobile phone. We're so reliant on it. Of silver linings, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, there are more questions, but we'll see.